on the OLE Board of Trustees and an OLE Ambassador. And uh, we thought we'd be more than qualified to kick off uh, any afternoon talking about uh, feeding tubes because both, both of us have been getting our nutrition this way for quite some time. Um, so we have quite, a, quite an action-packed afternoon and there'll be time for questions, just some housekeeping issues. We are live streaming and recording. So, uh, you know, if there's information that you'd rather not have live streamed or, uh, or recorded, uh, just be aware uh, in your questions or, or discussions. And uh, we will be going up till five o'clock where we hope to have a bit of a break Anyone here who has children in, uh, in our uh, care, child uh, care, we ask that they pick them up at that, that point because it will be closing. And then from about 5.15 to 6.15, let's, we'll all have a uh, conversation time and talk about things, uh, things in general. We have a bit of a, a program there. So with that, all right, um, we'd like to thank our sponsors today. And if we have anyone here from Halyard Health or Nestle's Health Sciences, please stand up. We thank you so much for um, your support of this tube feeding workshop. Thank you, yes. And we also have um, several representatives from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, that came in um, for this session. So if you would just rise as well. Um, Thank you for making the trip. It means a lot uh, for us to have you here to present and for your support. Um, our first speaker today is Cynthia Reddick. Cynthia is a registered dietitian who is a longtime friend of Oli. She's worked in nutrition support for 21 years and is focused on home tube feeding for the last 17, working to facilitate patient successes, um, transitioning from home, from the hospital to home and to provide a positive clinical outcome. She developed her passion of nutrition support during an internship at the City of Hope National Medical Center in Southern California. Cynthia has presented at roundtables, clinical posters, webinars, case studies in the area of home care tube feeding. She's with Corum CVS, Specialty Home Infusion Services, and uh, we look forward to hearing her talk to us today. Thank you, Cynthia. Mm. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to put my timer on here so I can sort of be self-aware with the time. And I'm going to do a quick check on my technology, make sure I know what's what. Oh, that worked. OK, beautiful. All right, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to this presentation. This is probably one of my favorite topics. I'm going to talk about tube feeding complications, and not once am I going to talk about diarrhea. <laughs> so I'm going to change the game here a little bit. So I like to know who my audience is. Can you raise your hand if you are a clinician, nurse, or dietitian? OK, great. Keep your hand up if you are a dietitian. And I've, OK, great. And there's physicians in the room, too. You guys can raise your hands. Dr. Mundi reminded me of that with his, hey, don't forget about us over here. OK, great. So I um, have some objectives here that we're going to talk about. I do have a disclaimer. I have some pictures here in this presentation that are pretty um, graphic in terms of we're going to be looking at tube site complications, OK? So usually I follow Dr. Kelly in this presentation, and she has really cute, animated, despicable me pictures. So I usually have a hard act to follow. What's that? About diarrhea, About diarrhea right? So um, I get to start off today. So I get to set a, set a tone here. Um, so I'm going to, the overall message is that tube feeding shouldn't hurt. And so my goal is to empower the clinicians in this room and the consumers in this room and the family members in this room to advocate for whoever's on tube feeding that is having problems or complications at the tube site, because I've seen too many people wandering around with complications that people thought were just a normal byproduct of having a feeding tube. And, you know, I'll talk a little bit about setting yourself up for success, like creating a plan that works for you so you can actually meet your weight gain goals, meet your calorie goals, things of that nature, because what happens in the hospital the protocols don't usually translate well to home. So we like to sort of strategize to meet your needs at home as well. And that goes for devices as well as your feeding regimen. 
So I'll talk a little bit about some adapters and things that are what I refer to as home care friendly. I talk about moving a hospital regimen through a home care friendly filter to make it achievable at home. And it's not always the same devices that we use in the hospital. It's not always the same regimens that we use in the hospital, but there's some adaptations that need to occur for success in the home. And then I'll touch very briefly on NFIT transition update. So I talked about, I said I wasn't going to mention diarrhea, but here it is. It's my obligatory diarrhea slide. So this is normally how we monitor tube feeding tolerance. As dietitians, we're looking for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. But when are we ever really looking at the tube site itself and the health of the tube site? Because that is what I have found to have some of the biggest impact in a patient's relationship with their feeding tube and their experience on tube feeding. So I know from experience that there are a lot of physicians out there that don't like to manage tube feeding patients at home uh, because they're a little bit out of touch and out of sight and it, we don't have the ongoing acute clinical monitoring of our tube feeding patients that we do with TPN. With TPN we're checking labs, we're in clinic. Many times with tube feeding patients they're home and stable and sort of doing their own thing so they're a little harder to manage and really the bottom line is that it's the home care clinicians, the home care providers that become the link to those physicians to help provide feedback about how things are going. So it's really important that those clinicians, whoever they are, have a really good understanding of how to manage some of these complications. So my goal when we're done is to have you all sort of indoctrinated into my, my club. So I have my ulterior motives here today. So I want to tell you a little bit about Debbie. Debbie is a long-term tube feeding patient. She's 78 years old, and she presented with this, I'll refer to it as a funky tube site. Okay, this was sort of normal for her. She would clean it, but at the end of every day, it would look red, irritated, and would have some gunk sort of building up over there. So there's what would build up for her. And so, you know, this was the picture. We do some sort of tele-troubleshooting. Right? So I'm trying to figure out what is wrong with this tube site. And it looked like it was probably a little bit too tight, but it wasn't too bad. So I wasn't exactly sure. I couldn't quite figure it out. So random act of luck. I happened to be in her neighborhood on a Sunday, and I asked her if I could come by. So I did. I went and visited her, and I had a conversation with her. I wanted to learn about her life on tube feeding. And she had had a leaky tube, and that's why she she called us because she was complaining of this leaky tube. She was certain there was something wrong with her tube. So what I learned after meeting with her was I wanted to understand her protocol at home. And she's a bolus feeder, and this is a Mickey button, and so she had little extension sets that she would plug in. Let me go back into, um, get the right button here. So a little extension sets that plug right into there, right? But in between feedings um, and right after feeding, she was having this leaking that was going on. So I wanted to understand the volumes because the first thing I want to look at is how much are you actually putting into the feeding tube? So I had her show me how she does her, her feeding and she did what I, I had never seen this before, but it was a power feed like I've never seen where she would draw up formula and pushed it through so fast, it made me uncomfortable watching it happen. So she put four syringes through, and she was getting ready to do her next carton of formula. She does two containers three times a day. But she would also do some hydration, and she'd put some Pedialyte in there, about four ounces of Pedialyte, a couple of containers of formula, and then she would normally do some water after that. But I stopped her after the first carton of formula so that we could talk about the rest of her protocol. And this is what it looked like. Four ounces of Pedialyte, eight ounces of formula, another eight ounces of formula, eight ounces of water, another eight ounces of water, and then four ounces of water. And she's five foot three, about 120 pounds. And I wouldn't have believed it if I wasn't there. So I stopped her after a carton and I talked about, you know, volumes. Like what's the normal volume of a stomach and what she is, putting in her stomach, she didn't really have the concept of how much that was. So I had her get a mixing bowl out of her kitchen and we simulated it with water. And then I held that bowl up to her stomach and showed her how much 
that was. It was 1.25 liters of formula in about five minutes flat. So that is when I learned and figured out why her tube site was leaking. She was overfilling her reservoir. And so when I explained it to her that way, the light bulb went on and she laughs at me and says, oh, well, that explains why when I bend over to pick something up after a feeding, I vomit because she would fold her stomach in half and then just everything would come out. So she doesn't have time for watering and feeding. This is her words, it's how she puts it. She's busy, she doesn't wanna spend all this time watering and feeding. So, but she was having this very poor relationship with her tube as a result of how she was doing this tube feeding. So we had to negotiate and we worked on slowing things down and spreading her hydration out throughout the day and then we worked on a plan to work on that yeast infection, which I'll talk about in a minute, because that's what's going on there. She had a yeast infection, which is why this is so red and inflamed, from all the moisture. From the, she was overfilling her reservoir. So I, this picture doesn't show it quite so well, um, but after a couple of weeks with it antifungal, slowing down her feedings, not having the leaking coming out of the tube site, her, her tube site started to heal. She had been using an antifungal. She had some at home, but the way she was applying it, it wasn't working. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So there's some very specific details that needs to happen with our patients when we're educating them. Uh, and she taught me that lesson as well, is to be very specific with the teaching. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But first I wanna introduce you to David. He's my other he taught me a lot. Both of these people came into my life about the same time. He was a very grump. That's my emoji. This is on behalf of my daughter, who's 13. She loves emojis. He, and this sort of illustrates the way he was at the time. He was very much an unhappy camper because tube feeding was very unpleasant for him. And he was not gaining weight. He was very underweight, as you can see there, and he had this constant foamy reflux and coughing that was occurring with his feeding, so he was not compliant. He would feed his formula and then wouldn't do the whole prescription because he was constantly refluxing. And like I said, this foamy, to the point, this foamy reflux to the point where he wouldn't leave the house because he'd have to spit into a napkin all the time. And so he wouldn't go drive, he could drive, he just wouldn't go anywhere because it was too depressing for him. So he complained that that was occurring and his tube site was frequently gooey because whenever I talk to somebody on the, on the phone when we're working on a regimen or working on something to make things better, I ask, how's your tube site? How's it looking? And so he said, well, it's kind of gooey. So we got some pictures. And what you can see here is a little bit of goo going on here. And this is what it looked like after it cleaned up. So this is not an infection but it's a result of what's going on right here at the stoma site called hypergranulation, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in a minute. But the reason he had this hypergranulation was because his tube was too big, so we had to resize him and get it fitted. But this ooey gooey was sort of a problem for him as well, as, as well as that reflux and, um, you know, he wasn't gaining weight. So he had all of these problems going on and he wasn't successful at home with his tube feeding and he just needed a few different changes. But what he was doing at home was putting on some triple antibiotic ointment because that's what you do, right? When something's ooey gooey at home, just go buy some triple antibiotic ointment. It wasn't working. He was cleaning his stoma site with a sterile alcohol swab as well which is actually part of the reason why this developed, this hypergranulation. So he wasn't cleaning properly and he was using a lot of gauze because he was having to clean up the ooey gooey. So what I did for him was worked a strategy where he, we changed him to a higher calorie formula so he didn't require so much to get the calories he needed. He also liked to blenderize formula as well and he wanted to start doing that again. And um, I came up with a program where he would do most of his calories from the formula, but he also would blenderize his own. He was a chef in a former life, which was so cool because he could make his own food. And then he would freeze it into ice cube trays and he would do his six cartons of formula per day and 10 cubes a day of his blenderized formula. So we've worked that out and that's when he started to gain weight again because he was then compliant and slowed down his tube feeding as well. He was power feeding like Little Miss Not So Speedy, the, um, my other patient. 
And so once he slowed things down, and then the last ingredient to his success was I worked with this physician to get him on an anti-reflux medication, and that was a game changer. The reflux went away, he stopped with the foamy reflux, and he was able to go out and drive around and visit family and visit his friends and do all the things that he liked to do. So that's David's story. And this is, this is my little pause. This is actually a picture of an Oli attendee. Um, and I'll let you spend the rest of the week trying to figure out who it is. You have to walk around in interviewing our two feeding ambassadors with Oli. But I love this. He has this tattooed on his stomach, you guys. Caution, do not overfill. Warning, exhaust fumes may be deadly. He, was, he recommends not hiking behind him on a trail. Um, but this is just a reminder to slow down and respect your reservoir, it, respect your anatomy, respect um, your body in a way. Even though tube feeding you know, is not something that you really want to spend most of the day doing necessarily, if you, ever, if you have to bolus feed, um, you still need to keep in mind you know, how big is your stomach, which Little Miss Not So Speedy, that's what I nicknamed her because her, her friends called her Speedy, but I renamed her. Little Miss Not So Speedy, so she would slow down her feedings. She actually asked me, because she was trying to push the envelope, well, how big is my stomach? Because I told her 1.25 liters is what you're putting in your stomach. She says, well, how big is it? Because she wanted, of course, to get to the limit. And so I had to do a little research, and because I didn't know, actually. So I found out that the average stomach size is 0.94 liters, so just under a liter. She's five foot three, about 120 pounds. So hers was probably about 0.75, which was about three cartons of formula, <laughs> which I'm sure she was already figuring out that math. So all of that to say that it's really important to keep that in mind and, and to respect your anatomy and, and to be kind when you're doing your tube feedings and don't power feed too fast. Most of the time we're worried about people going too slow um, are we rarely, we're rarely worried about them going too fast at home. But let's talk about what is the normal healing of a G-tube site, because what you're going to see after this is um, complications at the tube site. But it should look like a pierced ear. Normal flesh color, not red, not inflamed, nothing funky growing off of it, right? It should look very normal. So if yours doesn't, and it's uncomfortable, it should probably get looked at. Peg site infection is the most common complication in the literature, ranging from 3 to 30 percent. Bacterial infections and others, um, the factors that may increase the risk of in infection are diabetes, obesity, malnutrition, chronic steroid use. All of these things decrease, suppress our immune system and our ability to fight things off. We'll talk about bacterial infections first. Honestly, it's the least common thing I see. But this is what it could look like. This is another one. Uh, this is the worst bacterial infection I encountered. This was a patient that had been living with this baseline for 10 months and kept going into the GI doctor asking for a new tube because there must be something wrong with my tube, right? Well, as it turned out, the tube site, that's what this crusty, gooey, stringy, this picture is upside down, I think, but you can see the sort of the stringiness of it. This was baseline for her for 10 months, and so when we realized that she had a bacterial infection, we recommended to her physician an antibiotic. And so that we actually went systemic with that through the tube. Normally with a smaller bacterial infection, a topical antibiotic prescription grade, not triple antibiotic ointment, but prescription grade will actually do the job. But in this case, we, because it had been so long standing, we went, um, we went big guns with her. I think the worst part of her story, though, actually, is that she had been bolus feeding at home without a home care company, by the way. She had been doing this on her own, um, buying an oral supplement at the store. She's a Medicare patient. Um, and so when we encountered her, we realized, OK, she actually does qualify for Medicare coverage. So we were able to get her qualified and get her set up and get her on a, for a proper formula, one that's designed for tube feeding and not oral supplements. And then. Um, the antibiotics, but the worst part, I think, is the fact that she had been bolus feeding with a 12cc syringe for a year because she didn't know that they had bigger ones, and that was her life. She'd been, she would use those little itty-bitty syringes to feed with, so we, we changed her life with a prescription, a 60cc syringe. She didn't have to pay for the formula over the counter anymore. It was a good outcome. 
but all because she was sort of at home, not connected to a company, not connected to caregivers or healthcare partners in her journey that, that knew better. So hypergranulation might be the more co most common thing I see, actually. These are sort of the clinical descriptions of what you're going to see here in a minute. But hypergranulation, you, there may be somebody in this room who's been told by their physician that it's normal and that it's just part of having a tube. I disagree. And I have a problem with that because I've never met somebody who had hypergranulation that didn't find it uncomfortable. It's not benign, in my opinion, because it causes other problems. So it needs to be addressed. But it's very vascular, and it can bleed very easily, which we'll see some examples of that. What causes hypergranulation? The tube moving around too much, the, a poorly fitting tube, um, using rubbing alcohol, or hydrogen peroxide every day for cleaning will actually grow hypergranulation. Sometimes it's the body's own response to that prosthetic, but usually there's some other underlying cause in my experience. So I usually lead with a conservative approach with hydrocortisone cream ap applied directly to the hypergranulation, and that will usually 